let's get into our message. Father, today we thank you for who you are and we ask Jesus that in this short time that we have together, there would be divine revelation that would come alive in our soul and our spirit. I pray that the power of your word would take what is and make it beautiful. You are the God that redeems with every person in this room and every person in our family because we're in your presence. We're bringing them along with us. God, you restore, you heal, and bring life to every place. Jesus' name, amen. Turn your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 50. Put a bookmark there. I'm just going to read one little scripture out of there. Probably just, I have it in my text uh, notes, but I would like you to see it. And then turn with me to Romans 5. That's where we're going to start. Uh, Romans 8, excuse me. When Gary Wayne needs a good cleaning, sometimes woodshed, sometimes restoration, whatever, I go to Romans 8, and man, it just hits me between the eyes. No matter how many times I've read it, Romans 8 just really talks to me about your mindset. Things, places that you set your mind. I'm going to be um, talking in the next few weeks that I minister on a consecrated mind. And I'll explain what that means in a little bit. But recently, I have been just enjoying um, the Pause app. And I don't know how many of you have been exposed to that. If you haven't, I really want to influence you. Um, I, I can't make it a requirement to come to this church that you listen to the pause. But I have found that app that you go and download, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, you can download this app to your phone. It's designed to cause you to set up for your lifestyle, whatever, two times a day. You set an alarm to go off, and um, I like mine in the morning and the evening. An alarm goes off, and you click the pause, and, and John Eldridge um, comes on him and some other people These orchestrated to just spend about 10 minutes, that's kind of a long time, to five minutes pausing. And for me, what it does, it, it reestablishes God's uh, um, uh, perspective with mine. I get so out of sort with the truth of perspective. My perspective changes on the circumstances that I am being faced with. And we are so surface people that I am governed by my feelings more than I am by the truth of the word. And sometimes I literally deify my feelings as truth. And that pause app causes me to pause, to re-engage with God's truth, and so I can regain God's perspective of reality. I want to say that again. That pause twice a day captures my heart and causes me to regain the truth, the reality of what I'm facing. Recently, for whatever reason, I'll wake up in the night and I can't shut my head off. There's arguments I'm having with people, circumstances I'm, I'm engineering, I, I am solving the world's problems, and I can't seem to go back to sleep. And so I have just enjoyed, I reach over, put a little earbud in my, my ear, turn the paws on, and I just sit there listening to the truth of God. Sometimes it's scripture reading. Sometimes it's just uh, um, John Eldridge or another voice um, talking about reality. And before I know it, I'm sleeping again. And I'm going to sleep in his presence with my mind focused on him. How good is that, right? And so um, I don't want to take time out of this message to explain to you how to hook up with the pause. But if you need help, I, I would love to help help you. And so um, for the new, uh, I just feel like God would have us focus on 
consecrating our mind to him because on, in that pause time, that's some of the things that John prays and works through. And some of the prayers I did three weeks ago and today come directly out of that pause and or a book that he wrote. Uh, um, and so uh, from, from that paused moment, I keep feeling like God says, As a congregation, as a pastor, I need to minister on the topic of consecrating my mind to God. And so, because I've been so in love with John Eldridge's uh, 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 things that he's written, I have um, written into my message a lot of his stuff. So I just give him credit on a, on a regular basis. I'm going to be quoting and using his stuff. And I, I don't think it's plagiarism because I'm going to be trying to give him credit on a regular basis because just the way he says it and the way he sets it up, his, I just feel the anointing on it. It's God-ordained. And so I don't, I don't think I can do it any better by rewording it and making it Gary. So just telling you, for the next few weeks, we're going to be using a lot of material from John Eldridge um, from the pause. Three weeks ago, when I ministered on uh, the first part of how far is too far, um, we prayed together o- over our minds. More specifically, in that first message, we prayed to consecrate our mind to God. I explained it a little bit t- uh, three weeks ago, and I'll, I'll touch it again this week, but I just really feel like... Uh, um, God would have us to revisit that concept of consecrating my mind to him. So let's read Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Do you notice what that says? They set their minds. It's called a mindset. Every one of us have a mindset. Sometimes you set it, and sometimes you allow the circumstances around you to set it. But every one of us work life with a mindset, right? Those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, everyone in this room, everyone who's watching on video... They set their minds on the things of the Spirit. It's an an intentional thing. You aggressively set your mind. It's not just whatever. No, I take control of the things that would control my mind and I set my mind on the things of the Spirit. It's probably when one of my favorite topics to preach about is... 2 Corinthians 10.5, we take captive of things that would try and control us because God's given us weapons of war that are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So those that are living according to the Spirit, we set our minds according to the Spirit. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, the carnal nature is an enemy. It's at war against God. It cannot be subject to the laws of God, nor indeed can it be. I love this passage in the New Living Translation. There's there's a lot of good in each one of them, but I really like verse 6 in the the, uh, New Living Translation. And so I, I tried to print it. Now it's small print, so you might have to get your extra reader glasses. So I I reprinted it. Those who are dominated by a sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey the God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. I want to reread verse 6. It's somewhat highlighted in your notes. Letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. 
but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. One more time. Letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control my mind leads to life and peace. I'll try my best to unpack that. I I don't know that I can do it justice in the short time we have, but we have the Holy Spirit here to bring the things that Gary doesn't understand to your understanding, his revelation to make my heart come in line with his reality, his perspective, my perspective, right? So I'm going to ask you, would you consider to consecrate your mind and your thought process to God? Would you consider doing that in the next couple minutes as we have this time on this topic? Would you consider in the next few hours revisiting this all day today, tomorrow morning, not a blue Monday, a God-blessed Monday? Would you consider consecrating your mind to God? Let me unpack it just a little bit. To consecrate means to give it to God, to set it aside to Him. God, I consecrate this to You. I commit it to You. I give it to You. And so consecrate means to give something to God, to present it to Him, to be especially His. I'd, I'd love to take more time. Let's keep going in my notes. When you consecrate to something to Jesus, it allows the things that we consecrate to come under his protection and provision. So if I'm consecrating my mind and my thought process, my belief system, all the stuff that goes up here in the gray matter, if I consecrate my mind to Jesus, I am, a, I am giving it to him and it comes under his protection and provision. Don't you want that for your mind, your thinking process? Don't you want God to, have a, to, to provide and to protect your mind from the enemy's reality? So we truly want our whole life our mental life in all its fullness, we want it to be under the influence of the Spirit of God, governed by the Spirit. Almost want to stop and go right to the prayer at the end, but we'll get there in a moment. I want my mind consecrated to the Spirit so I can have His whole power at work in my thinking process, what I see, believe, hear, God, I consecrate it to you, comes under your provision and protection. Amen? Now, Scripture warns that you and I that we live in a battle for truth. What you see, what you hear, what you feel, on a regular basis, there's a war going on to get you to believe something different than what God says to believe. And so that battle usually takes place in the mind, right? A battlefield is a place where battles are either won or lost. And the Bible talks a lot about being in war. Now, if you've been in church very long, you know that's not a physical war. So it's not about going to war with your wife, your kids, your relatives, your boss, the government, right? It's not talking a a, a physical thing. It's talking you and I are under a battle that's going on in my mind that wars against me every day. Every moment of the day, there's a battle going on to cause you to wrestle between right and wrong. My conscience saying yes or no to the things of God or Satan's way, God's way. Then there's the whole Gary Wayne way. (laughs) You know, I've said this many times because it's so true. If Satan was totally disappeared and not a factor, Gary would still have a problem with what God is. And so, you know, it's not, I can't blame Satan for Gary Wayne's stuff, right? 
But the reality is, there's a battle going on 24-7. Rarely do I have quiet moments where I'm not wrestling. Okay? So, there's this warfare going on. Now, one of the things that I talked about three weeks ago in that prayer of consecrating our minds to God, I said this phrase in that prayer, directly taken from the pause, and that is, God, I consecrate my interpretation of the events of my life. I'm going to revisit this quite a bit in this message, and I felt like this was the one thing, the takeaway that God wanted to work in this room, miracles divine revelation, God's power to redeem your life. But here's the problem. We believe the story we tell. I'll revisit that in a little bit. But in that prayer, I pr we prayed, I prayed, hopefully you prayed, God, I consecrate my mind to you and I consecrate the interpretation of the events of my life. Let's say it again. Because I want that to sink into our heart. God, I give you this. I set it aside for you. It is yours. I consecrate for your provision, protection. I consecrate my interpretation of the events in my life, I said it, I give it to you. That is so needed for every one of us in this room, regardless of what you lived through and are living through. I consecrate the interpretation of my life. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 50 so you can see it. We have the story of Joseph. Joseph is now, it's towards the end story of Joseph, and he's with his brothers, and they're worried after his dad died that Joseph is going to revert to who they thought he was originally. And Joseph makes a statement, and I want to piggyback on that for consecrating my interpretation. Joseph said to his brothers, verse 20, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant good, in order to bring it about that this day to save many lives. Camp on this thought for a moment. There were events in Joseph's life that were controlled by other people. We'll talk about some of those in a moment. Other people were active involved in Joseph's life with an evil intent towards him. Was Joseph done wrong most of his life? That's what it sure looks like to me. And Joseph made this statement with hindsight perspective, having been in the presence of God and seeing God unpack the story. He said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Can I speak that over your life? The events that have shaped you, the events that have happened in your life from the time you were conceived, so in your mother's womb, to this day, God is actively involved in the events of your life for what? For good. I don't want to belabor the point, but I want us to get this with divine revelation from the Father, Father as He breathes over your life, the situations that you live with, the memories that you carry. God says, they may have meant it for evil, but Gary, I am telling you, I am the God of the universe. I am the God that has ultimate power and I can take the events that shaped your lives and touched you in ways that were evil, I can turn them around and I can redeem it and make every event that was evil for good. I just feel like I want to say it again. This is the God that loves you unconditionally. And he says, every event 
that was meant for evil, God turns it for good. Wow. Wow. Consider with me for a moment Joseph's life. What he was saying in that one statement, you meant it for evil. Look at some of the things that he lived through. You can read it on your own time. Genesis chapter 37 is where it starts. Then it picks up a story again in 38 through 50. Gives us just a little bit of the foundation. But one of the things that I want you to consider what Joseph went through with his family. As a child, he was rejected by his brothers. He never fit in, right? He was always the out person. He never got, because he was, I don't, I can't unpack it, but directed by his brothers. He became the focus of their anger at dad. They took out on Joseph. Everyone in his family did not understand him. His mom, his dad did not understand this dreamer. His dad loved him, but didn't understand him. And still, through the whole events of Joseph's childhood and teens or wherever he was at, I think young adult when he was sold, misunderstood by everyone in his family. No one got him. And then violent abduction, thrown into a pit. He didn't know whether he was going to be left there to die. They were going to just let him die, right? Right? And then he was hauled out and sold as a slave to save slave trailers. And he got to go to Egypt. I think, just, just imagine for a moment the trauma he was going through at this moment in his life. Finally, he catches a break when he was sold to the house of Potiphar as a slave. And Potiphar saw in him enough that he made him the head of his household. Finally, finally. And then, that's yanked out from under him. Someone lied about him. He couldn't defend himself and he was thrown in prison. And in the middle of this, Genesis 39.2 says, the Lord was with Joseph. It sure doesn't feel like it, God. God, if this is your blessing, what I... God... You said, right? You said you're with me because I don't see that. And can I just present to you, my perspective is often screwed up by my reality versus God's. But the truth is, all the way through here and in the middle of that uh, narrative of Joseph's life, it says, but God was with Joseph. And so, starts to turn a corner again. Here he is in prison because of his excellent nature, and he still loved God. There was a blessing on God. He comes to the top of the surface again, and there in the middle of the prison, he was in charge of all the prisoners. So he catches another break, and then what? He, I guess, maybe, and then he was forgotten, right? And then one day, God said, okay, I've orchestrated events in your life. Now's the timing for you to redeem hundreds of people. Thousands of people. If you take into fact that he was in charge of saving a lot of Egyptians. Because I have to believe that when Israel nation left Egypt, I think some Egyptians went with them. I don't know that. That's Gary's view. So, I don't think Joseph's perspective in chapters 37 through 40 was the same as in chapter 50 when we read this. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I can see now with the perspective, all of a sudden the pieces are fitting together and God orchestrated. I didn't get why I had to go through this. I don't understand it. I don't, it doesn't make sense to me, but here's the truth. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And this morning, I want to speak Speak that truth, that reality over your life. What the enemy meant for evil, God turns for good. So even as a dreamer, 
God gave Joseph dreams of the future. I don't think he had a clue of the goodness of God that was being demonstrated in the events of his life. Yet that they were. In the middle of his trauma, there was a presence of God that I think Joseph didn't understand. In the middle of the trauma he was going through, I believe God was fully active in orchestrating events with God's blessing and anointing. Yet because of the circumstances, I'm guessing Joseph didn't understand that. So let me apply that to your life. Every event that happened in your life that shaped you, God was and is in control of. When I say about the battle in our mind, a major part of the battle of our enemy wages with us. Do we actually believe what God says to us is true? Because I think Joseph must have thought different times, is the God I serve forgotten me? Have you ever been there? I have. And so a major part of the battle that we wage with our enemy is, do we actually believe what God says is true about us or do we allow circumstances, our negative experiences, the voices of those against us, my own feelings, my own insecurity, the voice of the enemy, do we allow circumstances to tell me what truth is? And I'm going to say, yeah, I do. That's why it is so important that I set my mind, my thinking process in God's care and I say, God, I give you my thought pattern, I give you my thinking, I give you my imagination, I give you my interpretation of the events of my life because the truth is God speaks over you truth. Holy Spirit, let that vibrate through our DNA. That God speaks over you life. God speaks over you destiny. So the voice of the enemy says what? The voice of my insecurities say what? The circumstances in life say this, but here's what God says. And this is just a couple verses in my notes, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. I wish I could unpack that. Sit with Papa. Go home with this scripture and just sit in his presence and let God speak that over you. He spoke it over you before you were born. In the womb, God danced over you and spoke over you. Right now, in this day, he is speaking truth over you. Tomorrow, where He lives, you don't. God is speaking. I have plans for you. All things are orchestrating for your good. Jeremiah 29, 11. I love this. I know the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Come back to this in a second. I just remembered last week, two weeks ago, someone was ministering on this and they made the point saying, you know when God spoke that, I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you. Did you know they were spoken to people that were in bondage? They weren't just set free in freedom. God was speaking to a people that were in dire circumstances and yet God was orchestrating events, but it didn't feel like it, right? I know the thoughts that I have you. I love the NIV. It says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. We usually believe the story we tell ourselves. Holy Spirit, let your presence help our minds right now. God, help us with this interpretation of events in my life. Because we tend to believe the story that we tell ourselves. Wish I could go off on the sideline a little bit. 
to touch it but come back. I've studied the thought process and the storing of memories. And you've heard me minister on implicit and explicit memories. Implicit memories are things that you carry that you don't know about. A lot of them start in the womb. You had a spirit and a soul that picked up things around you, but you were ignorant about it. Things happen, and because of the ability your God-given brain has, it shelters you from the power to destroy you. And so sometimes those memories are stored, and they impact your knee-jerk reaction. You just don't know why. They're implicit memories. And sometimes they're hard, ugly And sometimes Holy Spirit wants to bring those memories to the surface so he can deal with those individually and heal those now explicit memory so they don't don't cause your knee-jerk reaction. And so we live with the story that we tell ourselves. Events happen in your life. Someone did this. Pastor did this. So-and-so did this. Mom and dad, I was violated. I did, I was a drunk. I was, I, all these memories hit our life and we tend to believe the story that we tell ourselves. Now, a lot of times the facts in that story may not be true, but if you believe they're true, they will impact you as much as if they were true. Now, that can be debated a little bit, but your heart believes this is true, you will live like it. And so it is so important for me to consecrate Set aside the interpretation of my life events as unto the Lord so God can redeem and take evil and turn it for good. Hmm. I'm going to touch this just a little bit. In in time's sake, I, I would love for Don to speak on it, but just help me to get the facts right. Don became a Christian when he was 12? Yeah, a little later than that. Okay. Young and he had an encounter with God that's awesome. Holy Spirit moved in his life. He would be out on the tractor doing the farming things and the Spirit of God would move on him. A little bit later on, he gets drafted into the army. Here's a man that is dedicating his life to serving God and healing people and God puts him smack dab in a situation where he's killing people. What's up with that? God, do you know what you're doing? And the events hurt Don's heart. And for years... Out of that pain came a lot of knee-jerk reaction. Now God moved awesome in Dodd's life down through the years, but he still carried this, put God, put God. And about two years ago, a year ago, he was with a counselor and he again asked the question, put God, and the counselor said, let's ask Holy Spirit. And God began to download into Don's spirit and soul a different perspective from God's perspective of what God did with Don's life. Don didn't see it, couldn't see it because the pain of the events, the story he told himself masked or covered up all the good God things that actually were being orchestrated. And in one moment, God took Don from Don's perspective to God's perspective. And so God did a miracle in Don's heart to bring him to a place of reality. That's God's reality. And I'm asking for that same event to take place in each one of you this morning. If, if you can just imagine this supernatural spiritual bubble coming around you and you are isolated in the loving Father's presence. Right now, Holy Spirit. Heather Ann, would you come to the keyboard? 
This morning, would you be willing to consecrate to God the interpretation of the events in your life? Are you willing to give up your understanding? Are you willing to give up your definition, your interpretation? I'm asking you this morning to give that to the Father who loves you. This morning, are you willing to give up your preconceived evaluation of truth and allow God's truth to not just influence you, but this morning, will you allow God's truth to change how, what you believe? Romans 12, 2 says you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Every person in here, especially with those hard memories and the interpretation, I need the Word of God to transform my mind, my thinking. Spirit of God, let your Word transform my mind. I like this in the New Living Translation. Let God transform you into a new person by helping you change the way you think. I like the wording, but you can get lost in it. I need the Word of God to wash my dirty mind. We walk through life and our mind picks up all this pollutants, little Klingons here and there. Sometimes they were self-induced and sometimes they were put on me by other people. But you walk through life and sometimes life can be messy and dirty and ugly. And I need my mind washed by the word of God. That how, that, that's how Ephesians says Jesus is clinging the church by the washing of water with the word. I need a dirty mind cleaned by the word of God. And the only way I can do that is intentionally getting into the word and being in his presence. Say, Father, you created me. You know what I need this morning. God, you know what I need from your word. I don't understand what I'm written. I don't know your ways and things, but I am allowing you through your word, through your spirit to heal the revelation, the purpose of my life, heal my interpretation. I would like us to take communion together so we can have two people come and and serve this. Would you hold the elements? Don't take them until we take it together and or when I say, okay. Go ahead and just start passing them out. Father, we bless the bread that represents your body broken for us. We bless this grape juice that represents the blood that was poured out that paid for every part of my healing. The body talks about healing, broken for our transgressions. The blood covers my sin. He just covered it all. And so this morning, in taking communion, I want you to just kind of stay in that spiritual bubble, just you and Papa God. And I want you, use your words, reword what I said this morning. Say, God, here I am in your presence, remembering what you did. I'm remembering a covenant. You redeem what is and was. And this morning, I consecrate my mind to you. God, I give to you the interpretation of the events of my life. I I can't even fathom some of the trauma that you have been exposed to. God can. He was there. And in his mercy, his presence was the reason that you're able to be here today. Maybe somewhat crazy. But because of him, so much better. So in the next couple moments, I'm going to kind of pray. You can go off 
with him on your own. You don't have to listen to me. You can just be, do, do you. Or if you'd like to join me with the prayer that's written in my notes. Father, here we are in your presence. We are at a holy moment. Doing communion. Knowing this is a representation of love covenant that you made with us. Father, this morning I con- con- consecrate my mind to you. Father, I give you my thoughts. I give you my focus. I give you my attention. I speak over every attention deficit person here in the name of Jesus. Let that part of your thinking, your personality, come into wholeness. No longer a deficit. Your attention now becomes a positive. Father, I give you my memory. All the memories that I carry, implicit and explicit. I give you my recall. Father, how those memories come to the surface, I give that to you. I give you my understanding. I give you my imagination. God, this morning, I consecrate to you my interpretation of events in my life. Holy Spirit, would you target the areas in my heart where there's a belief system, a structure that is warring against your truth. I pray that you would tear down every false belief, things I value that are of no value. I give to you all the things that reside in my heart. Holy Spirit, lead me in truth. Go ahead and take communion, whatever you would like. Yes, Jesus. God, we do this in remembrance of you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I meant to talk to Tony and Beth before. Would you guys be able to come up front if people need added prayer? Thank you. It's highly likely that God brought to the surface some of your memories of trauma that you lived through. There's various ways of doing it. But can you do just kind of a general blanket? God, I give to you my memory. I consecrate. Here's this memory. Bring healing. Here's this memory. Bring healing. God, here's this trauma that happened to me as a child. It was meant for evil, but your word says you're orchestrating it into good. All things work together for good. God, today in this place, as you're bringing to the surface the things that have controlled our life, we take it out of the control of the enemy and we give it to the control of the Spirit because those who set their minds on the things of the Spirit have life. And today I speak life over every person in this room. Their thought processes, their thinking, their imagination would be committed to you, Holy Spirit, so you bring this people into the vibrant person that you have ordained them to be. God bless your people today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this morning.